Much of what you are hearing was selected from Ted Thomas's Wednesday night coaching calls, where Ted's coaches not only answer all of your questions live, but will give you their insight and tips in areas you may not have thought of or encountered in your tax lien certificate or tax deed buying experience. Good evening, everyone. This is Crystal Migliori, a.k.a. Coach Crystal, and I'm your host. I'll answer your questions on tax deeds and tax liens from beginning to end. I want to remind you, awareness is so important because by habit, we do so many things. We unconsciously... Just how many of you actually remember taking a shower in the morning? You know you took a shower, but were you really thinking about taking a shower when you were doing it or getting dressed? Things that we do every day. So you need to be aware of what's going on around you. Don't forget to stop and breathe. Take a deep breath. If you're stressed and hurried, take a deep breath. And people say, of course I'm breathing. Yeah, but have you actually stopped and taken a deep breath? Or do you just breathe without even thinking about it? Be in the moment. Enjoy what you're doing. If you've decided that this day is the day I'm going to do something I really enjoy, even though I have other things I should be doing, that's what you've decided to do. You've blocked your time out to do that. You can spend time here with your family, whatever. Be in the moment. Take guilt-free time off. Enjoy yourself. It's okay. That's the point of life. Live your life on purpose not just let it pass you by and then go, what happened? We went to Sonoma County tax auction today, and I was very successful. I came away with two pieces of land. Yes. Today was a good day for my coaching clients. Woo! Yes, excellent coaching all the way through. When you talk about minimum bid, we had researched a lot of properties and – we came up with minimum bids. I did not go over the bid margin. There were people that were bidding up to 75% of the homes, and some of the homes had been sitting, so it could be estimated at anywhere from twenty to $30,000 that they would have to fix on the inside, and they were already at minimum profit margin, minimum. So, yeah, it was crazy bidding, so I really appreciate you and Ted, your coaching techniques. And the minimum, the bids that I was awarded, it was just for the minimum bid, even though all through the auction I was bidding up to my maximums, and I didn't get anything until the end of the auction. And then once I um, acquired one piece of property, there was a person who ran late from the bank, and they missed it, and I bought it. So we're in a little bit of negotiations right now. <laughs> you know, that's pretty good when you can um, sell something right away to someone else that wanted it because they weren't ready. So that's you got to be ready. That's what I, I drill in all you guys, right? Be ready. Yeah, get correct. your information. Know what you're bidding on. Have that maximum bid. Know what you can do with the property. Look at everything in the sale, right? I think we right. talked about this last time. What I do yes, is, I guess, is backwards what everybody else does. Everybody else, I think, looks at the list and picks out the ones they want. I look at the list and I leave everything on until they prove that it's a bad investment. And you then know what? I'll take we, off. We, we took your advice this time because I think that's how I missed out last time. We left everything on the list and see what was profitable for our profit margin. And if it wasn't profit for my profit margin, then we took it off of the list. And it still left us with plenty of options. And this time, normally I was going for the homes, but this time I added a bunch of land parcels, and that's what I was rewarded with. That is so yes. good to hear. Thank you. And then because I, I told the lady, I said, we can't really do anything until I get the tax deed in 30 days. So I said I will, will for the title, I'm sorry, for the title in 30 days. And then uh -huh. that would be the way we could sell. So that's correct. I have to wait till I receive well, my, my deed. No? I was just going to say, you know what? You might call the county and ask them that before that tax mm -hmm. deed is issued, if you can assign your position in that to someone else. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but assigning it your position would allow 
possibly allow them to create the tax deed in the other person's name. And then that person, before that assignment was put in, would pay you what you paid for the property and whatever extra amount you negotiate. And that would possibly allow them to step in your place. You can do that on tax liens, and you can do it on tax deeds with right of redemption. You would have to check specifically if you could do it with that tax deed. But that would avoid you being on chain of title on the property, number one, which is probably not that big of a deal, but it would get you paid faster, which is a big deal, because if you can get paid a month faster, what happens if you can roll it over again? So what you would do is you would contact the county, ask them if it's possible before the deed is issued that it is someone else steps into your place and that's assigned to someone else and see what they say. So it's somebody else's name that would be put on the deed. But that would be something you would not want to do until you were until you were paid. Okay, we should answer some questions here. Hey, Kevin, what's your question tonight? It seems that we can approach the opportunity that Ted's presented to us in many different ways, but you talk about it like it's a business. How important is it for us to have a definite sort of business plan blocked out, even if we don't know exactly what the details are as we move forward? Could you make a few comments on that for us, please? I'm pretty casual about things, even though I <laughs> have a number of businesses. I normally don't do formal business plans. But that's because I've never really needed to. That doesn't mean it's the best fit for everyone else. Okay. Here's the thought, though. If you know what the plan is, and you can put at least some of it in writing, doesn't have to be greatly detailed, is it more important then to spend more time working on the, pl the business plan or implement it, making it happen. And remember, I'm a coach in Ted's one-on-one -on -one coaching program. So my focus is on whenever something's going to get in the way that's going to steal time and slow people down, I ask myself, hey, can it be done without that? Because a lot of people can get hung up on doing a business plan. Now, I'm not talking about a plan for the year. I'm talking about a business plan that has a lot of, a lot of details. And I also find that when people start implementing what they're learning, they might find out, oh, this is a little bit different than I thought. I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's how I think of it, because I'm always looking at avoiding the roadblocks, avoiding the pulling over on the side track on the railroad tracks and waiting to get some more information or to do something instead of keep chugging along on the tracks. Because when you pull over, everybody else passes you by and you lose that momentum. So I'm all about keeping people moving and moving forward and not getting hung up about sometimes overthinking things. And what I found is if people don't know, confused mind says no. And a matter of fact, it usually doesn't say no, it usually just stops. The motion stops. So I'm always looking at keeping people moving along. So mm -hmm. a formal business plan or not, for some people, if you're going out and getting investor capital in some situations, that might be necessary. I've never found it to be a roadblock. So sometimes there's things that are nice to have and there's things that you have to have and other things that oh, it would be nice to have that. Can I make it happen without that? That's my thoughts on a dream team, too. Some people focus a lot on building up your dream team. Well, if you can build up a dream team before, when you don't have anything you're really working on, why can't you do it when you need them? Because then you'll know what you need specifically and who and where they need to be. So it's sometimes things like that kind of get people stopped or stuck. That's a great answer. I guess the real question is, if we want to do this to make money, then is this going to make us money sooner or later? And go for the things that will do it sooner. Yes. I've learned that 
through the years of experience. Don't wait. Just well, don't, you're a don't great wait example for perfect. us all. Thank you all the very best. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, Crystal. It's Kelly from Regina, Saskatchewan. This is my first call. Good. I got a couple questions for you. Okay, good. Being Canadian, what happens if the homeowner claims bankruptcy? If they declare bankruptcy before the sale, the county has to pull that property out. If they, because once there's a bankruptcy declared, it puts an automatic stay on any collection efforts. Things stay in place. They can't, any creditors can't continue to collect. It's a violation of the federal law, and it's not good. So as soon as okay. somebody's been noticed, they should not ever make any more collection efforts while that bankruptcy is still open. So they would pull that property, withdraw that property from the sale. When I did look at Ohio a little bit, it, it appeared to me that um, Ohio wanted 50%, minimum of 50% bid on, the, on wherever the assessed value was. That's not correct. That's not correct. Or possibly that one county was requesting that. Okay. Because I know th this actually just came up a little while ago. Their share of sales for lender foreclosures start at, I believe, two thirds of the market value. Their share of tax sales. It's whatever the, the amount that they had uh, gone through the legal process with. There's a starting bid, and it's different. It's not a relationship to market value. It's the, the judge, basically like the judgment amount that they got there. So I'd say look at those rules again. Okay. And if you have to, talk to the tax collector or whoever is coordinating that sale or the sheriff and verify. And if they say that is the case, then look at something else. Now, the only thing that it possibly might be is if there's a homestead exemption or something like that, maybe there's a, a rule on that, because that's what it's like in Florida. If there's a homestead exemption, then the bidding has to start at 50% of the assessed value in Florida. Sometimes you'll run into something like that, but that doesn't mean that's the case on all of them. Al from Alberta. Question about when you are bidding on a tax lien certificate, let's say in Florida or Arizona, will that also keep you posted as to whether you're being outbid, like if you put a 16% bid down and then someone puts in at 15%? Generally not. Okay. Generally not. It, it depends on which software company is actually doing the sale. In Arizona, when I participated in Maricopa County's online sale, you, I put in my interest rate that I would be willing to accept, and it was only after that group closed could I see what the low interest rate was, what the, the winning bid was. That's where it's important to go through and do their practice because right. what I realized is that, wow, maybe I better reevaluate my interest rate. And I quickly looked at some research and researched the properties that had been on my list in that first group and saw what the interest rates were that were accepted and then decided if I wanted to change my strategy for the next round or not. And so in that case, no, I could not see that. Now, in places like Illinois, where it's online, but you go use their computers, there, as the different properties come up, you can see what the lowest interest rate is, and you can choose to lower yours, but it's a very quick process, and it's just a good idea to go with whatever your lowest is at the time in Illinois, because literally they, the certificate number, it floats across the screen, right. and you have the time that it's floating across the screen, and then once it gets past there, it's done and on to the next one. So that would be where if you're doing a tutorial or the training, it would give you information on what it's going to look like and if you would see that or not. But 
I would not expect to be able to see other people's interest rates at their bidding until that's closed, and by then it's too late. But you can use that strategy for future closings. And that's why online they do different kind of like blocks or lots, not that you have to get them all at once, but so you know what you've got, so then you can determine what you can bid, have available funds you have available to bid in the next group. Sometimes in the newspaper I'll see the tax deed and they won't have an address. They will just have a legal description. Now, is there a website that I can find the address from the legal description or do I have to go down to the courthouse? Often if there's no address that goes with that legal description, then mm -hmm. they've not assigned an address to it. But if you go to the assessor's website or there in Florida, it's going to be the property appraiser's website, Mm -hmm. And you take the parcel number, the mm -hmm. number that they Oh, have they don't even put the parcel number down. They okay. just have a, a case number. Okay. Then you would have to use that case number then to back into the parcel number or use that legal description. So go okay. on to the property appraiser's website, and mm -hmm. you want to do a parcel search to get information on that particular parcel, what it is, and look at the different ways that you can search. If you can search by legal description, then just start putting in the legal description. You don't have to put all of it in. If you can search by owner name, if you can search by that case number, then that will bring up the information. What you're more than likely going to find, there is no street address for that property. So mm. once you have what you need, then often from there it's linked to a parcel viewer or a GIS system, geographical information system. And then how you can find out where the property is located is often you can get information on adjoining parcels. So then you could use their information or identify button. Often they'll have that. Or you can double click on the parcels around it. And it, if there's a house or structure there, then it'll have a house number. You might find that it's between 101 Main Street, 105 Main Street, and it's across the street from 102 Main Street that would give you enough information to be able to find that property. Okay. okay. And they That's... usually do not, it's very common that street addresses are not issued until they make improvements or until there's their building. Usually if there's no street address, that means it usually is a lot or a piece of land, but mm. it's a good idea to check because sometimes something's been built on it and they haven't updated their record. Hi, it's Vitaly from New York. How are you? Hi, Vitaly. I'm fantastic. How are you doing? Fabulous. Thank you for asking. I have a couple of questions for you today. Hopefully, okay. uh, you'll shed some light on it. One about, I keep hearing Ted saying in his program about tax deeds in Georgia, how it's a penalty state that it pays 20% your first year. However, if you roll it over to next year, it pays 30 and then the following year, 40, and he says that I strongly recommend you not to foreclose the first year, right, so you can receive higher percentage the second year. Let me tell you a little bit about that. Number one, you have to wait a year. Right. And the, so basically if you start the process after that first year is up, then if they pay during that process before the foreclosing, they'll have to pay 30%. I think if I remember right, you might be able to start that process a little bit before the 12-month mark. But so uh -huh. if you wait till past the 12-month mark, then you can start that foreclosing on the right to redeem. And then when uh -huh. they're paying during that, basically after that 12-month mark, then it's 30%. So the penalty would be 30% on it. Uh, I see. Because my question was, if somebody did not redeem their property in a year, what makes you think they're going to redeem it in a second year? So why would not? They might redeem once you start the foreclosure process, and then they have right. to pay you what you paid for the property plus the cost of the foreclosure process, and then they have to pay the penalty on that. See, that definitely sheds some light on it. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. I wanted to wish you a happy new year and let you know that we have updated our website over at tedthomas.com. Check out the free webinar training, or you can schedule a consultation with Paul Castillo. Every Wednesday, we post a new podcast, so don't forget to leave a rating and a review to let us know what you think about Imagine Wealth Without Risk.